This is a paradigm you're going to see. A successful bond project is built on the foundation of an accurate and dependable estimate. You got your junk in your estimate, you're going to have a junky job. Because that's something. You got a bad estimate, more than likely you're going to have a bad job. And over the course, let's see, I started estimating in 1979. I can tell you, I can remember every job that I put together as a piece of junk. <laughs> because it hurts every time you think about it. Yeah. And you never forget those. But you learn from them. That's the most important part. Uh, I'm Mel. Working since 79. I've worked, uh, I learned from a GC here in Kansas, I Topeka. And I was very fortunate because I was sitting on a pile of two by fours, sitting up plywood fours. <laughs> with mud up to my waist, and it was damn cold. The owner of the company came up to me and said, are you going to do this for the rest of your life? I said, I don't think so. He said, why don't you report to the office on Monday, and I'll teach you how to estimate. So I was very, very fortunate that he brought me out on the field. I got to go to the office, and I got to work on learning how to estimate. estimate. The biggest thing that he had to do was break me. Because about every 15 minutes, I'd get up and walk around the hall. I couldn't sit in a chair because it was just a foreign concept for a guy that's worked in the field. I was in the field for about five years to sit at a desk for 12 hours a day, 10 hours a day. That's kind of what we worked back then. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to work in about 17 states. I've done everything from petrochemicals to the last job I did in Chicago was a 40-story concrete porn place high-rise. That's a whole different world. And the biggest thing you think about is the difference between pouring 20 floors and 40 floors. Nothing. Because you come off the edge, it doesn't matter if you're 20 floors up or 40 floors up. You just fall a little longer. And the biggest thing that we that I had an experience of on our pump, we had a vertical, 10-inch vertical stack, we were pumping our concrete through, going up to our, our head at the top. Well, we blew the first 90, and we hosed about 60 cars with concrete falling about 20 feet. Oh, you don't put that in a damn estimate, but uh, we got a really good deal from a buying shop that wanted to repaint 20 cars. And some of them were forty, fifty thousand dollars 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 Why they parked there, I have no idea. But you put the insurance in the estimate, though, didn't you? Oh, hell yes. Okay. Hell yeah. So jobs, this is kind of dated. I've worked on jobs at about 125 million. I think it's pushing closer to the order now. Um, I've been a member of ASPE since 05. I got my certification for CPE in 07. I'm now acting as the national president for ASPE, which it sounds okay, but hell, it's another full-time job, which is really stupid on my part. The kind of along the lines of estimated for 40 years. And somehow I, I still think I need psychiatric help. Yeah. What we do, what we look at in the concrete, there's, there's a couple types. What I call horizontal concrete, Walmarts, little medical office buildings, things to that effect. Things that you don't have to worry about vertical transportation very much. Everybody every knows what these are, right? Remember the old Johnny clamps? You know, right? They ride up there with hairpins. Johnny had clients with just a, a spin cog type form that racked when you drop a 2 by 4 and lock it in to the button tie. This is what I call horizontal concrete. The uh, second type of concrete would be vertical. We do an awful lot of vertical work in Chicago. Uh, the biggest issues that we have with vertical work in Chicago is you have a full city block, you're going up about 650 feet, and the only lay down you have is the eight square feet of sidewalk that goes around that city block. So the coordination, trying to figure out how you're going to in. I, the last permit I bought for a crane was $65,000 to put a tower crane up because I had to shut down Wacker Drive and Adams for three days, which was 5 o'clock on Friday through 6 o'clock on Monday morning. 
meant that that was how much my permits cost, let alone how much it cost to erect a crane. Mm -hmm. So the nice thing about estimating buildings like this <coughs> and in the same light, treatment plants, for example, if you've got six 100 foot diameter clarifiers, you take off one times six. Floors are the same way. Usually once you get up to the fourth floor or so, four through 20 are exactly the same. So you take one off times 19, 20, how many floors you have. So it's a multiplicity of estimating. The whole key, right here. Make sure you use the right number of floors. <laughs> do, you, do you multiply by the lift? Okay, so you say that 11 through 20 are identical in your estimate. Yep. The pumper doesn't think so. The pumper doesn't think so. Your vertical transportation of your crews don't think so. Yeah, there's a lot of reasons why I don't think that's right. Well, it is right to extend. I've got the same amount of square footage. Oh, yeah. But if you look, I'm going to show you one of my estimates. I have each floor isolated. Mm -hmm. And each isolated floor, the productions are different as you go up. Mm -hmm. So, so okay, the general, you have a boilerplate that says this is what a floor cost. Right. And then it has a burden depending upon its elevation. Okay. Absolutely. How you do it, how I do it, will be different because you guys understand how you put your estimates together. Mm -hmm. We as estimators, I, I can lay down the same set of drawings and we're going to come up with 25 different numbers. Some might be close. Some of them are going to be a little skewed. Yeah. Okay? That's kind of the principle of the vertical. Uh, this is a little building that I was involved in. We're about halfway up. Mm -hmm. 12 foot between floors seven and a half inch PT slab. Mm -hmm. uh, with each of these floors, I had to come back in here and reshore after we stripped out the people who were sagging. Mm -hmm. So that's all in the understanding of, of going up. The other type, specialty type, is restoration. I just came from working with a restoration company where we did a lot of concrete repairs and stuff. And we concentrated on refineries. Like if, if there's a fire, we had to go in and replace all the fireproofing on all the steel. And that type is totally special. It's totally foreign to anybody that's a builder. So the big red flag there is go find somebody to do it for you if you have to do it. It's not something you want to bite off. Because the technicians, the uh, <coughs> thoughts, the process, the chemicals are different than normal concrete. Really different. We used a product that was called Key Strata. It hit 8,000 pounds in 24 hours. And the problem that we had with that is it, it set so fast. You, you mixed it in a half a five gallon, two and a half, two and a half gallons is about all you can mix at a time for you like that. Mm -hmm. Or you had a nice fishing weight in that bucket. That seems like a perfect you know, things like this. You've got to come in, chop, patch, repair, save the rebar, put in supplemental rebar. A lot of these here, you're going to have to drill back in so many inches of epoxy grout valves. It's not part of what we're going to talk about today. I just wanted to throw it on the table. So. There's, there's a couple ways of doing concrete estimating. I grew up with the way that we did with man hours, crew, materials. So I knew what my production rates were, but a lot of people that I found use unit prices. Wall concrete's 550 bucks a cubic yard. If you do that, you need to know what's in that 550 bucks. You just can't pull it off the sheet that somebody else is using. Uh, you got to remember that if, for example, a footing, you're going to touch every side of that footing. Sometimes, more likely, you're going to touch every side twice. You look at that, strip your, you know, set your forms, you're going to let me start at the bottom. You're going to prepare your subgrip. That's touching the bottom side, right? More, more than likely, when you're talking about touching it twice, I've always seen the plumbers come in and run their pipes through, or you've got some guy dragging crap in. So you're going to touch it twice, even though in principle you only need to touch it. You strip your forms, you set your forms, you strip your forms. So as you go around that footing, 
you're going to touch all four sides. So that's going to give you, what, eight touches on that footing for labor. If you leave part of that out, your labor's going to be cheap. You know, and of course, you can combine pure and finish. You can combine form and strip. Some people keep form and strip separately. Some people keep forms as one line item in your estimate. The other people take and have strip as separate line. It's how you want to prepare what you're used to working on. Uh, Several types, like I said, several types of this. I prefer labor materials. You've got man hours, you've got crew hours, you've got time frames. The other type is unit price estimating, where you just say I got so many, so many dollars a yard. <coughs> well, that's fine if you're using that for rough order magnitudes, for budgets. But if you're actually going to perform the work, labor material. If I know that I've got a thousand man hours on that job and I got a four man crew, I got 240, 250 days. If you get the time. You can't get that out of the other comparative estimates. That's a very simple labor material spreadsheet. This is based on man hour. So example. Farming system column, we've got 2,500 square feet. 16 square feet per man hour gives me 156 hours. Labor price at $100 an hour for this hour from Chicago. It's just the way it is. And then material, two bucks, $5,000. Then this extends all over. I want it big enough so you can see it. All that makes sense? Is your labor price a burden price? Yes, that one is burden, but it's not marked up. Okay. In actuality, it's 122.50 right now for up there. The profit over there would be on it. But then I put feet on the bottom of the total job. Okay. The way I do it. You say marked up, so it's got burden, but what, what, what's out? What's outside of that if it's burden? What's out what? What's outside of that if it's if that's all, if that's a burden rate? What, what? Fee. Fee. Okay. Just fee down the bottom. Yeah. Down the bottom. And a lot of times, uh, the way I have some of my spreadsheets set up is I go up to the top, I can just change one number, mm -hmm. and all the numbers change. So, this is just a little sample. You know, you, there's a couple more columns over here like equipment, and cranes, incidentals. Wow. I hate talking after lunch. <laughs> All right, the other vision that we have would be this unit price. <coughs> Concrete. That's the main slab, 550. The problem with this is what's in 550? You as an estimator need to be able to explain that to somebody. These work real well for just quick RLMs. Budgets, but they're not a what I would call. Uh, it's not what I would call a competitive estimate. You really want to get down to it. You set your crews, you set your productions, you run off your histories. You can even pull something out of RS means if you're not really sure what you're doing with it. But I'll bid against anybody using RS means any day of the week because I'll beat them every day because their numbers are high. So, labor on a job <coughs> is always the variable. <clears throat> my labor rates, your labor rates, my productions, your productions, they're never the same. I always bid jobs with my, what I call my B team. So if I'm fortunate enough to get my A team, I make a little extra. But then I can promote my C team coming up. The company I came from just recently, we had like 7,000 technicians. So we're working all over the United States. And we sent our guys there because our work is so special. But you're not guaranteeing you get the best crew. So you kind of got to look at rules of average for your labor production. 
such. We've got to look at also the uh, crew mix. That's why I bid a lot with just man hours, not crew hours. Because my idea of setting up a crew and your idea of setting up a crew can be different. But if I were like 16, uh, this one, like 16 square feet of man hour, that's easy to change. If I got five men, it's five times 16. Materials, materials are the same. If, if we're all bidding off the same set of drawings, we all should be able to get the same way through this. Same qualities. Because length times width times height, it is what it is, right? <coughs> Unless you make a mistake and multiply a floor by five and there's only really six, that type of situation, that can't be fixed. So we all understand the simple mathematics of taking off concrete, right? Does anybody not do concrete in here? Wow. Okay. So all of us understand and can read the drawings. It's all the same, unless you're on a, a specific design build project where they're not producing a lot of drawings. But we're all bidding the same fire station down the street. We all have the same set of drawings. We all should be able to do the same takeoff. We should all get our pricing from the same ready mix guy. It should be all the same unless you don't pay your bills, and that makes a difference. But uh, the other nuances that would be different between estimator and estimator would be bulk hits, how big a pour I want to make, how big a pour you want to make, and how you break it down to like water stops and all the ancillary things. But these ancillary things are a very small percentage. We talked about this. I'm kind of like, damn, this was, this is a, four hour thing I try to chop in here. These are, uh, how do I say this please? These are my screw ups, okay? After years of doing this crap, you've got to read specifications. And uh, I spoke to a, a CSI group and uh, everybody knows what CSI is, right? I talked to a group about three weeks ago, nobody knew. I said, oh, where do you guys come from? They were all just kind of there. But anyway, this presentation I did was called Where's Waldo? Because I'm going to guarantee you somewhere in those specs, if you don't read them, there's going to be a gotcha. Where's Waldo is my gotcha. Okay? Uh, mixed design. Understand the mixed design. Because if it's four bag, five and a half bag, six bag, whatever you need to do, you got to make sure that you know that so you can project that to the ready mix guy. Did a big job where they dictated pour rates to me. I had two and a half foot thick walls, ten feet tall. I could not just start in a corner and start pumping concrete like a possessed individual or I would have ties and it's flying into the banks and forms letting go. You got to look at that. In addition to pour rate, I had an engineer tell me that I had to vibrate in the top three feet of the previous pour. So you had to then make sure that your vibrator went into the previous pour three feet before you brought it back out to consolidate the cold joint. High rise, deck curing time before you get stripped and reach short, fly down the next floor. Chicago, we like to make that about four or five days so we can go to the next one. The biggest thing there is you, the thickness of the slab, the density of the PT, you have to watch that. So when you strip it too soon, yeah, you strip it too soon, your floors are going to sag. That's why you come back in and re reshore after you strip your floors. That's nothing more than two by eight down the road with post shores in the center of each bed. Um, all your specialties. I had a guy. I figured PVC water stop. I missed in the spec where it was steel water stop. Steel water is not free, cool. You know, you put it at the end, you don't have to worry about laying down. But then you have to weld the seams. You know, welder it. And it costs a hell of a lot more than plastic. These, you know, little things like this will <laughs> kill the estimate. You have to explain why you didn't do that in three. So, 
Is all this making sense? Yeah. So when you have you have your drawing, your specs, your scope drawing, like all of it just a if you have a big enough project, there's just thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of stuff that you just kind of, as a contractor, are like, hey, you're responsible for this. Yep. So what do you, how do you get to a point, a point of confidence um, with like what, so that you're not missing items like this? Are you just spending, like I'm trying to put the estimate together in a like efficient and quick manner, but I also don't want to miss that. You, uh, <coughs> is it just, is there, is there something that you specifically do like, okay, I've done enough now that I've. You, you page through all this trying to understand the project. I told one kid, I don't can't read that fast, I take a speed reading class. <coughs> what I have done is I'll take Microsoft Word or Bluebeam and I'll word search. Okay. And you word search water stop. You word stop search pay or mixed design. Cure time. You, you, you got this, you got all these gotchas on a post it stuck on your wall. You get a big spec in. I've done core engineer work for the specs for like that. Mm -hmm. Word search the damn thing. It'll pull up what you need to do. You don't even want to read about the exterior coding of HVAC duct work. Not to do the concrete thing. Okay. Simple things like that. You get to where you know how what where you need to concentrate your attention on and what you don't need to. Gotcha. You know, you are know, running Simon's forms. You know, that's that's all we ever use, Simon's forms. <coughs> don't spend any time reading the form. The only thing you have to pick up is how back how long the cones need to be and if there's a water stop or not on your ties. But other than that, you're going to use your time and forms. You're not going to go out and read F codes or something. Unless it's really a weird structure, like key heads on a highway. Those are the little tricks you pick up. Save you a lot of time. And if you do, if, if this is your fifth job with Burns and Mac, you know where the little holes are at Burns and Mac spec. Make sense? Yeah. You got to get those little tricks because you're responsible. You know, in your quote, you're responsible for all plans and specs related to Division Three. Yep. Unless you go to the bottom of your proposal and start giving me three, four pages of exclusions, and if I see more than ten exclusions on a quote, I throw it in the trash. So that means you're not beating the drawings. If you're a sub. If I see a lot of that type of stuff or a lot of modifications on the job that I'm getting, I'm getting quotes in, I don't have the time for that. Do it right or don't do it at all. <laughs> With concrete, we always argue about waste matters, right? And don't believe the guy that says rebar replace. Rebar displacement is your waste bag because it's a bunch of hooky crap. Okay? Unless you've got a job that's got semi loads of 11 bar. Yeah. You know? But you still are going to burn a lot of concrete waste. Uh, a lot of people use a percentage on like four walls and footings. Slabs are a whole different story. Percentage really doesn't work right with slabs. Depends on how much money you want to pay for subgrade prep. Okay? I like to use anywhere from a quarter to a half inch of square foot for waste on a slab. I have used 30% on slope slabs like oxidation ditches because I know there's no way in hell that I'm going to have my dirt guy get me a slab or a slope <coughs> grade that's right. I have seen those slope grades go to 30 from 30 to 50 percent. There's a lot of stinking concrete. Especially when you wait, when you estimate the thing in an inch. You know, you get bit. Or the alignment is off. That's the biggest thing is the alignment. Because of the weight on the form. Yep. Yep. Would you say your weight back more than a flat slab? I use a half an inch. 
That's not much. Not when that subgrade's doing this. Now, if you're lucky enough to get that subgrade to a nubbins, that's cool. But if you're putting down what we call CA6, which is AB3 here, you want to spend all that time grading that stove? Because I'm paying hundred dollars on this job. My estimates, I'm paying hundred dollars an hour for labor for carpenters. And I just use that as a deposit rate for carpenters' labors. I can buy a lot of damn concrete for hundred bucks an hour, <coughs> especially on a big slab. Concrete's cheaper. The, you, you can run it together that way. Yo, do you change Somebody your waste? It's a way. <laughs> do you change your waste factor depending on the thickness of your slab, or you just stick with your quarter to half inch? <clears throat> I just say that because, like, when you deal with four inch concrete versus six or ten inch concrete, to me, you're may possibly have more waste factor on the four inch because it's harder to get it. You're going to lose a half inch no matter what, how thick the slide is because the stone variations and the labor cases do that. But if you're looking at a percentage, a percentage of a half inch on a four inch slide is a whole lot different than, for, than the half inch versus a 12 inch slide. Right. It's a judgment. Okay? There's times where I wanted to squeeze the waste factors down to nothing and get a job and then pay for it somewhere else, you know? <clears throat> you gotta remember, the estimator is the guy that everybody throws rocks at. But we also develop a very, very thick skin after a couple, three, four, five years of this stuff. But then, you know what you're talking about and you go at the people that want to throw rocks at you from a position of strength and knowledge. You want to argue about concrete? I'll argue about concrete until the cows come home. I know what my estimate is. And I'll come to the guy and get right in his face that way. Because I don't want to go, uh, uh, I don't, uh, all that means, you don't know what you're talking about. Okay? So come at it with strength, understand what you're doing. Yeah, this is some more screw ups on my part. Things that get you. I don't mean to be negative about this stuff, but us older guys, we've got the stripes, we've been whipped, we know what things to look at, all right? Stainless steel versus carbon steel, a percentage of tie. I did a core job five years ago when they wanted a 75% tie on the rebar. Okay? You guys know what that means? I don't. That mean, huh? I don't know what that means. 70% 70, 70 of your cross sections have to have a tie wire on it, which means a lot. Yeah. Usually you tie just enough to keep the bar in place while you pour. And if you've got a big, what I've normally done is if I've got a big thick slab and I've got a double mat, I'll light tie the bottom and I'll heavy tie the top because the guys are walking on the top, they're going to bust it down. So I'll do a 50% tie on the top and a 25% tie on the bottom. The other thing you look at when you're talking about tie rebar is how are you doing it? Are you piece tying it in the fork or are you ganging it over into the bank, bank and swinging mats in or columns in? It makes a difference on how you handle that. If you part tie real lightly on the bank, you hook with two uh, <coughs> hooks on the top, lift it and swing it and watch the bars just start sliding down. You have to tie it a little more than that. But when you do that, it makes a difference. But when they dictate to you the percentage of tie versus what I think I need, it's a world of difference a lot of times. Especially if you're tying in place. I'll, if, I, if I'm crawling the wall and I'm tying as I go up, where I'm walking with my hooks, I will tie 100% because I know I'm standing on every one of these rungs. Over here as far as I can reach, and over here as far as I can reach, they're going to get a light tie just holding in place. Make sense? But the thing that you have to remember about that is the more you tie, the more time it takes. And it doesn't mean, the guys we use use reels and wire and pliers, not the little spinner thing. Okay. It takes a little bit of time. That works good too. Yeah. I just got exposure to 900 bucks a piece and it's worth every penny. That's, that's nine hours. And those last for what, a couple years? No, they last longer than that if, you, if the guys don't drop them in the concrete. 
Well, that's just like the reinforcing, right? Can you charge for that? Yeah. <laughs> There's a stupid tax. Yeah, sure. stupid tax. Yeah, we all have that. <laughs> Mixed design and special admix. Some of these can, special admix. Yeah, yeah. Can I ask about that? Because this is. Uh, yeah. Mixed design is based in no small part on temperature. Yeah. And you in Chicago have got more experience than I do with big variations. Yeah. And the inspector, the special inspector, is standing there with his recording thermometer. And for this two hours, you were below the temperature of the mix. How do you deal with that? And that has caused more heartaches on a construction site. It does. Turn, it does. It's, it's ridiculous. I still got some. <laughs> yeah, I did. Join the club. I think mix design and the special animations things were probably created one of my ulcers that I had a few years ago. Well, I mean, the only uh, thing that, that, that I've come up with is that you're on the phone with the batch master. Mm -hmm. And you're saying, and, and then every truck that comes in, you ask the driver, when did you leave? Yeah. So that you know what his transit times because it changes with traffic and all that. Right. And and then you give it some windage. You do. You have to give it windage. But, well, we but it scares the, it, that is the thing that scares the hell out of me because yeah. you're, it's, it's a wild ass guess. It is. What we have with Ozing and Prairie in Chicago is when we make a big pour, and a big pour up there is 8,000 yards in a day. Wow. And we have, I have done one up there that was 12,000. 800 trucks. Yeah. In Chicago traffic. So when you do that, you pull all the trucks in from all the remote plants, the main plant down off the river in Chicago. And we're all in headsets and radios. We have everybody on the core. We've got the batch master and the owner of Ozinga. Lead to the young guys. Yeah. <laughs> Too old for that. Yeah. I, I don't do it anymore either. Mm. But they ticket, they time stamp every ticket for every yeah. truck that comes yeah. out. Okay. And you know the temperature, weather conditions. And if it's cold, you heat the water up, you heat your aggregate, you bring it up to temp. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't dip below the threshold of cold. We use two. Two ounces of super plasticizer in most loads that we're pumping because the water cement ratio has to stay around 0.5. Yeah. yeah. Take it below that. And a lot of it depends on your FF and FL on how hot you're going to get those floors, which you're going. But what we've done is we heat above the slab, especially suspended slabs, we heat the floor above. <coughs> the floor. So our temperature inside, we have wrapped the Vertical Center. stacks on our pumps with heat tricks to keep them warm, and that all adds money. It could add, it could add 15 bucks to the yard easily. E yeah, easy, easily. Uh, a lot of the old guys that I had for superintendents, I, I just said, there you go, you pour, you delay pour if you have to. Mm -hmm. It's not good, but you do because we get a, a nor'easter down. We'll be 20 below zero for the day. Shut this job down. We can't do it. I have poured at 10 below. with an elevated platform for a CTA station. We lost one slab that froze. That's because some little kid came by and shut the gas off to the burners. We lost our heat. The coldest pour I ever saw was in Nizhny Novgorod, Russia at the airport at 3 a.m. They were pumping concrete and it was 49 degrees negative Celsius. Yeah. Negative and Celsius. I went, Celsius. I went, you gotta be kidding me. You guys are tough. <laughs> at Structural, we have 104 guys working at Perdogo Bay, Alaska, mm -hmm. which is up on the North Slopes. <clears throat> the high last week was 31 below zero and the wind was cooking out of the northwest back. 30 miles an hour. Yeah. We lost one, no, two weeks ago, we lost one concrete truck. It froze before it got there. So you know what you do with a frozen concrete truck, you know, they got 
they disconnect the barrel and roll it off, put a new one on. Yep. In the spring, they'll chip that out, clean it up, put it back on the older truck. So, cold winter concrete is a pain in the ass. I, I, I couldn't believe that those guys were pumping concrete. I went, wow, no wonder you worked with the Germans. Yeah, how hot was the water in the mix? I, 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 was, I was a passenger around coming in on the Oh, okay. I wasn't, long. I mean, I was, I was just going, you got to be kidding me. That's nuts. <laughs> That's nuts. This, this one with the admixtures, and this with weather conditions. You do a weather, I've done a weather conditions estimate that's been separate from the sheet. Uh, Scott's Bluff, Nebraska. They wanted us to pour right through the winter. So our estimate included enclosures, mm -hmm. consumption of protein, uh, slower production rates. It was a whole sheet, whole mm -hmm. litany of, it was an estimate by itself to just handle winter conditions. conditions. Uh, local conditions, winter conditions, weather conditions, a separate yeah. amendment to the end. And then we had the other thing that we have up north is traffic control. Uh, if, like I said, if you're working in downtown, when we went up the 210 North Carpenter, it was a 40-story tower with a five-story podium. Right here was the green line on the elevated track, the subway tracks. Yeah. And we had six, if you drew around the whole building, we had six feet. That was our lay down area. We stuck our office trailer on top of the pedestrian, uh, uh, pedestrian protection canopy. Yeah. Our office trailer's right there. We stacked material on top of those canopies going around the building. It only crushed three people when it all fell down. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But what you do is those special conditions with having the things to do with concrete, you have to noodle those out. And if you don't know, find somebody that does know. Your ready mix guy will help you with that mixture. He'll help you worry about special things. You tell them what your conditions are, how you want to do it. They have the chemists. Yeah. Talk about the non fly accelerator, is that kind of a means and method of course, is that uh, some of the specs would determine? Depends on what you're doing with it. It's a lot of means and methods, but it depends on what you're pouring, when you're pouring it, and how you're pouring it. I love things that have a six and seven inch slump. You're not going to do that with water. So you have to have a plasticizer. Your accelerants makes a difference on your dosing, whether it's 30 degrees or zero. Yeah. You have to do an accelerant. Uh, I personally don't like them. I'd rather have my labors or my finishers set there for a little while, but you got to get it set before. If you're pumping a two-inch gas main to 30 heaters, make it cheaper to accelerate it. But you're still going to have to keep that slide warm for five days. It's all in how you want to do this already. Okay. Mm. Everybody loves software. I don't. I like Excel. You're not a software fan. It's not as important as old, as old guys that have been carrying concrete around their boots for 30 years. No, I think so. What you can do, I, I'm the oldest Timberlight user, I guess it's Sage now, in the country. I've been, I've been using Timberlight since 1983, back when it was a DOS system. <laughs> Besides us, everybody know what DOS is, right? Okay. Sigma's another good one. Bill Carey's the guy with that. He's an old friend of mine that uh, yelled at each other. He think we were enemies when we saw each other and we hugged. So just getting it. <coughs> you can't rely. The database system is great for populating them, <laughs> but you can't rely on it. If your default is 32 square feet per man hour, and that's all you ever use, you're never going to get a job. Or you're going to lose your ass, one or the other. It's a, it's a two-way thing. Um, I had six estimators working for me who were using Timberline. I went in the weekend, and I took the whole database to one, one man hour per unit. I took all the material pricing and had it at a dollar. I really 
pissed some kids off. But it made them look at, I'm sorry, I apologize for saying kids. I know that's improper. My team made them look at every line in that estimate and put down the production rate for labor. It made them look at every material cost item and put down the right price. If there was a dollar left in there, I could call them on the carpet. The other thing that I told them as I repopulated the database when the exercise was done, if I ever see you put $100 in there for anything, I know you guessed. Anything. $100, $500, $5,000, I knew you did not research what that price was. Because that's a big red flag. You might as well highlight the cell in red because I knew you guessed. You've got to know your pricing. You've got to know your production rates. If you don't, go find somebody that can help you with it. I love having superintendents look at my estimate on production, and then whatever they tell me, I cut it by 25%. <laughs> hey, it is the way it is, right? You cut it by 20%. And you give them a bottle of booze and stuff yeah. in December. Yep. Here's, here's the other thing. I had an estimator that I trained. And he's, he's still a very, very good estimator. But it was a carpenter for me. And he blew his back out so bad he was in a wheelchair. <clears throat> So the insurance company paid me to train him as an estimator because he could sit on his butt and do something. To this day, he's probably the best concrete estimator I know. Guaranteed. Because he's better than I am. I'll go head to head. And I was in the field. But his prices were so damn complete, we never hardly got a job with him until I started cutting. He could tell you how many nails it took to nail the damn chamfer in. Okay, so get people that have the knowledge. Know what you have in a database. Update it. Just don't leave it the same thing for two and three years. It should be updated once a month. <coughs> Not the whole thing. <coughs> once a quarter. Once a quarter. Okay. But you never want to plug in numbers off the database for materials. You need quotes. Because if they're wanting to use a BASF 440, that price changes about once every three weeks. And they're never going down. No material prices ever go down, do they? No, they always go up. So you got to know what's in that database, and let's not use it blindly. The worst performing estimate that I ever did was based on one material item, plywood, <laughs> because there was a little thing that one where was that place um new orleans that got wiped out oh the hurricane <laughs> yeah all of the plywood in america went to louisiana and you could buy the stuff with gold and the price doubled i was three much days. far behind it. it it doubled in in three or four days and we had we did not have the price locked in. Yeah. We were locked into a job, but we didn't have the price locked in on the material. Yeah. And it a, cost. Uh, oh. We worked for free for two and a half months. Yeah. I had a project up at uh, Mount Stewart Air Force Base in Great Falls, Montana. And it was 24 eight plexes, two bedroom eight plexes for the Air Force Corps of Engineers out of Seattle, mm -hmm. as at that same time. And my trust packing tool from the trust supplier was $6.5 million worth of trusses. Oh. And I asked him how good is his price for. And the job was bidding in two weeks. And he said, end of business today. Mm -hmm. That's all he could guarantee it. So we had, it was all stick frame buildings. This is just a truss package. It wasn't the walls and every, everything else. So we had to go in there and we looked at ENR and the production rates and the changes and their projections and all that. And we took a three iron and I'm a horrible <coughs> golfer. Popped in a escalation price at the end. And what, the way we fixed that issue was we bought the local lumber yard that was going to close. Happened to have a spur head coming into it. 
So we bought every piece of lumber for that whole job, which was about, it was a $92 million project. So the lumber package on it was about $21, $22 million. Mm -hmm. Bought it all in, put it inside storage, racked it all up. Pros all our pricing. If you can do that, it's just forward thinking. Then we opted to prefab all the walls and one of the big buildings, and so the lumber was there, and it's, yeah, it, just, it just kind of snowballed each other. It was a good job. If you ever see the act of God uh, line in the contract, yeah, think of me. I will always think of you. Yeah, because that was that was where that came from. It's Katrina. Katrina. Yeah. So I like database type estimates. They're quick. Just this is all I'm using right now because I work for seven different clients and they all have different softwares so they want my estimates in Excel. Everybody has Excel, everybody knows how to use it. The only thing I don't like about it is if I do a timber line, I know that some of my prices are pretty much frozen. Anybody can come in and screw with my estimate. They can unlock it. I don't lock it because I let them do any modifications they want with it. Copy paste it into their estimates. So you got to be a little careful with that. And the thing about this is if you've got a very, 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 very complicated estimate in Excel, it's a real good way to screw the world up. All estimate, estimating software can save you time, but they also accentuate your mistakes. If you've got a thousand square feet of this and it costs 10 bucks and you're going in real fast, you put a buck in there, that's bad because you're losing money. If you go in there too fast, put a hundred bucks, that's just as bad because you're not going to get the job and just waste three weeks of your time. They're both bad. Whether they're short or whether they're long, they're both bad in estimate. I, I never give a client an Excel spreadsheet. I give them a PDF. I would like to do that, except my clients want me to do this. And it is in my disclosure on my estimate my proposal that goes with my estimate, mm -hmm. that this is the dollar amount based on this timesheet, and I always have a copy of that estimate backed up. Yeah. So if they say, well, it was, it was a million dollars. No, it wasn't. It was a million two. Here, proof. And I'll print that out on PDF, put the proposal on the put in the file. So, these are all good, good systems. You just have to be able to handle the system that you're using. Okay? Computers, S3 software, no replacement for wisdom. Think about it. Just don't use your production rates and material costs at face value. Mm -hmm. Always think about it. Wisdom, think through. You can, have, like I said, you can amplify your mistakes from one way or the other. No, like on purpose. On 
purpose of some blood. The number one mistake was the bitters didn't. Or not the bitters, but the, you know, the substance you go to. Do they do that in Chicago? Yeah. Thirteen's out of lunch. There's no... You and know, how often do you find somebody that forgot to skip that floor? Oh, I found guys skip four things that you want to talk about. Just well, the whole floor is like... <laughs> you talk to every four floors, it's like a whole set of well, a lot of money on the floor, right? Yeah. Let me see if I can get this. It, it's... When I, if I can read this thing, work. Uh, Dan, L. We need Mel. If, if it won't go to, pull out the HDMI and then put it back in. I did that once. <laughs> and that usually works. <laughs> what I have done is, as, as an estimator for this mess, you have to know your subcontractors. Proposal and scope better than I do, than he does. Okay. What I've done is I send them my scope requirements. I don't let them just send me anything and everything. They have a full list of what I want to pay. As a concrete sub, I want you to include uh, washout, bag, and disposal. I want you to include X amount of extra steel. Because I know that the engineers are going to put four bars around the corner and we need to do this. Pounds. I'm going to tell him how many pounds of steel I want him to add to his quota. Uh, I'll tell him how much I want him to you know, pour, lay down area, his office area, and then I'll go through foundation, footings, walls, suspended slab, slab on the grade. Uh, I had one concrete guy leave out a 50 by 200 by 12 foot deep detention basin that was under the parking lot. He was really low. Jeez. Yeah. Well, I said, what are these dotted lines in the painting area? Thank you, Dan. Well, he, I, I don't know. I said, that's a detention basin. Okay. Where's it show? I said, S100. I think it was 100.01 through 05. Oh, I didn't see it on the drawing, so I didn't think it was included. What the hell? So many floors detailed out. And I will go from 12 to 14 on my listing. So sometimes you got to stick your finger in their nose. Now, please, don't take me wrong. Sometimes you got to stick your finger in their nose and take them with you. Okay? Now, if you're so, I apologize for saying that. I'm a GC, but I sell performed concrete. you got to lead them. you got to talk to them. Pick up the phone. Walk through the scope. Not email, not text. Call them and talk to them. All right. How do I get rid of this? Um, <laughs> there you go. What do you need to do? This was a fun little job. And you'll see, this is just an Excel sheet. Up at the top, I've got all my materials. Okay? I've got my labor by man hour. A lot of times I'll have different crews and different crew mixes, but on this particular job, they wanted me to you price the job by the man hour. Okay? My takeoff for suspended mild steel. I've got my beam sides that didn't have any on this floor. This is like the third, third level. My quantity, my labor man hours, my production rates, and et cetera, et cetera. The nice thing about this sheet is that if I go up here to man hours, Changed on my man hours. I pray to God. I hope it. So you mess up the formula, and you don't update your man hours. So this works real well for me. But what I, what's key with this is down here. It tells me the floors, the west tower or the east tower, and they all report back to. And then what I do a lot of times, this was like a $20 million tower concrete package. What I do is through everything that I've done, I know that my concrete should be around 50, 55, $60 a square foot of suspended deck. 
this job, my bid is around 63, 68. That's my cross check. Now, if this here, you know, I know it's about, this is what it is. I should be right here, so I should, it's going to go between 19.3 and 21.2. But this tells me that I am pretty close. You always need to have a back check to your number. I know that uh, over the last five jobs, similar jobs, the jobs were running 650 bucks a cubic yard. Well, if this job is 800 and something, why? If it's 400 and something, why? That's your gut check. Everybody that does estimating needs to have a gut check. And my gut check might be, I'm going to have, you know, Chuck here, check it for me. Walk through it. You know? That's just good business. You know, if you're playing around with a $21 million package on a job, you better make sure they're not all damn close. Now, the nice thing about this was I go join against adjustable forms and uh, Walsh as a third-party validator. They just want to make sure to keep those two guys honest. So I'm a GC. Good. And so a lot of times we're getting stuff that's pretty conceptual in nature. I'll get a floor plan. Yeah. How much is it going to cost to build? And I've got to make some assumptions on foundation. I've got to make some assumptions on slab. I have an idea. I mean, typically I kind of know what that should look like. But what do you do for rebar? Is there a percentage you can roll through rebar? I mean, if you figure, hey, i got, you know, a, a continuous footing, 10 pounds a foot, 10 pounds a yard. Is there somewhere that rebar you can throw in there? I know what concrete should cost, yeah. but I want to be, just like you said, know what's in it. So I'll, I, got, I got assemblies that I run through there, and I'll pop rebar in, and I'll do all that. But I don't have a detailed drawing. I don't have this. I don't have that. I understand. I did a uh, $98 million high rise with a perspective and a floor plan. It's quarter shut. But it's kind of. Yeah, I mean, and they give you like two to three days to throw those. We've worked together out. and we've done $40 million core jobs yeah. on a test fit. <laughs> Am I wrong? No. Nope. Yeah, on test fits. Yeah. And you have, to, you have to decide what that looks like. You get a very elaborate qualification letter, correct? <clears throat> Pretty much, but you still have to make assumptions as, hey, I'm assuming number four bar, blah, blah, blah. I'm assuming this. I'm assuming that. That's what you do. Uh, this one little job I did, I made an assumption of 3.5 pounds of PT per floor, per square foot. You can assume that per cubic yard, you got 60 pounds of rebar. Mm -hmm. You know, that, uh, write it all out. That's all you can do. It. You're, you're, you're like I am. You got to check, check. I know rebar on on this should run about you know twelve thousand dollars on a typical MOB, four thousand square feet. Now, it's, it's, it's wisdom. And when I get all done if the concrete looks like it's between four fifty and five fifty a yard, I figure okay, I'm actually kind of in the ballpark. You're in the ballpark, but you know that four fifty and five fifty number. Now if that same thing you put that together and you were at six and a quarter, you'd go back and check it again. Mm -hmm. If you were at three and a quarter, you really go back and check. Correct. Right? Yeah, and it's people, it, it's like, if you're just now doing this, a lot of this is, it just doesn't look right. Sniff test. It, it doesn't smell right. You look at it, it's too high or too low, and why? It just doesn't look right. What I forget? <laughs> you didn't. You didn't. You know, along the same light, if you look at this, this is a pretty elaborate estimate. Would I do this with every job? No, it's, it goes on and on. And I did all my quality survey with on screen. If I would do this, this is all a different looking estimate, isn't it? Real simple. <coughs> Quantity, length, width, height, cubic yards or square footage at 450 a cubic yard for what is that? Slab, 750 for walls. That's a gut check estimate. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, what's an R line? What's it going to cost for the concrete of this structure? Well, this particular thing, if you look down here, I did all 32 trades on a budget. So you look at that, and it's not very elaborate, but you've got to remember that on your main pump station slab, one foot eight inches thick, I'm running at 550 a, a yard rebar, <coughs> subgrade, forms, finishes, strips. It's all in that four, that 550. Mm -hmm. Those I did. Or was, can I say five? Yeah, 550. I know what's in that 550. I can give you the breakdown from my library. How much, How thick did you just say? One foot eight. My this foot. is a treatment plant. I love thick slabs. I mean, you just yeah. take Simon's and two foot Simon's run around, snaps and yeah, chamfer yeah, on it. Go. I didn't hear the number correctly. I was going, uh, if it was a thinner slab, like a six inch, I put square footage up there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because I had to just stand the square footage number. But when you're, you're uh, you know, one foot eight, square foot number's going to be skewed. Yeah. yeah. So you have to treat it like a horizontal wall. Yeah. Yeah. So. This particular job, it goes back, this is a nice estimate machine. I use this one quite a bit for budgets. It all goes back to another summary sheet. And with the summary sheet where I can look at this, I've got my percentage of total. So, just another double check. And since it wasn't R on, I put 10% contingency on it. So, does all this make sense to everybody? Am I talking Yiddish? I can say that since I live in the north side of Chicago. There's a lot of Jewish guys up there. Hey, Mel, Yiddish is good. What was the answer to Bill's question about the rule of thumb for um, reinforcing steel per cubic yard? The rule of thumb on that is. Come up with, it makes a difference on what the structure is. Right. If it's this treatment plant pump station, yeah. it should be around 65, 70 pounds per cubic yard. Okay. All right. If it's a residential thing that's got <coughs> four number fours in the footing and a yeah. vertical under 25 feet. Okay. It's 15 pounds. I wasn't sure if you had linear foot per cubic yard because that's a different story. Or, or pounds per cubic yard. Pounds. Got it. Thank you. Pounds. You tie it, and you, you subcontract it in tons, but you uh, estimate it in pounds. What about a, what, a cast and place structural wall that's holding up um, like a parking garage or something? You probably move, move that up to almost like 50 pounds a yard or more. Mm -hmm. Okay. I like to go back to jobs that I have in the archive and kind of come up with percentages. If you're going to do a lot of that type of work, right. you need to have some sort of history yeah. where it's going to be. Residential spread footings and the stem walls are going to be so many pounds. Right. Parking garage is X. Standard commercial with basement Y. It's all in your logic. I'm yeah, the so rebar takeoff, that's a tough cookie. That's not for everybody. And it's the most miserable thing. In and all, in all the years we've been doing ASP, estimating academies together, we've never had a class on taking off rebar. And there's a reason for that. <laughs> yeah, you know what you do? You send your drawings to the rebar supplier. You, how many tons is in this damn thing? Yeah. And then you price it by ton. That's why it's fifteen hundred bucks a ton to tie it, not pounds. Right. I wouldn't do a take rebar takeoff anymore. I did one real nasty one, and uh, I wouldn't do another one unless I whipped me with a horseman. Just like, no interest in doing that shit. There used to be a guy in that that did nothing but that. Yeah. And I don't know what happened. He's in the psychiatric hospital down the street from his house in a white yeah. jacket. The guys yeah. with butterfly yeah. nets. So, guys, I wanted to not teach 101 because everybody here knows 101. I just wanted to talk about nuances, things that'll bite you in the butt. Different philosophy, different ways of thinking about stuff. Questions? Comments? I just want to say, using RS means is not bad. You've got to have a place to start. RS means is a great place to start. But and just then, think and about the numbers. Yeah, but
and then you got to go back and say, does this make sense? But you can at least give you a place to start. If you don't have, if you don't have history, or you're working somewhere, we work all over the place. You've got to use means. Yeah. Because that's right now, means is the only consolidated data, or estimating data you can look at. And I know all the guys at Gordy because we're working with them to validate their costs as ASPE and CERT. The biggest thing that will bite you with means is you don't include everything <coughs> for that system. I mean, it's not regional either, right? Yeah, yeah. it is regional. It is regional. Online, it's regional. Right? Yeah. yeah. I've got the books. I'm you can sorry. narrow it. If you go online, you can narrow it right down to the city. Yeah. But what you have is they'll have a price for Forbes. They'll have a price for concrete. They'll have a price for bar. They'll have the price for fit. You gotta make sure you have all the parts and pieces in your system. And if you well, if you build good assemblies, you can take care of that. Yes. Yeah. Yes, but I'm just talking about somebody grabbing the book. Yeah, I'll go. Exactly. And going in and saying concrete footings. Yeah. yeah. You gotta make sure you got everything in there. It's like building bidding a jock job, you know. You gotta price everything, you know, the hinge, the four screws on each leaf, mm -hmm. put it in, dutch it. You gotta price the whole thing. Now, Frank R. Walker, I met with Gene last week, and my suggestion is take all the pricing out of his book. Because it's all old. Yeah, so well, I yeah. actually saw that. It's really old. It's really old. Now, they got a new edition coming out 32. 33 will be um, digital. 33 will have ASP logo, and we are looking at the new Really? Yes. Now DNI is actually not bad either. DNI is okay. Yeah. What I would do is take um, and tie the two of them together. I do that and looking for and also looking for labor and costs. I'll go out and check out I'll go out and check Davis Bacon You have to. Just to see where all that sits. This big job that I did up in Mountain Air Force Base, I went to the Union Hall to start checking out carpenter prices. Really good. I said, I need 165 carpenters. We got it. I said, great. I said, where are they from? That's the whole state. That's a whole listing of all the carpenters for the whole state of Montana. Mm -hmm. I sent the carpenter to a guy out of Dallas. Yeah. A rookie. So, yeah, it, you, you have to be very careful. You've got to watch what you're doing. So, are we good? I see a lot of bob bobbing. And I see a lot this is a really bobbing. pointed question, but. Shoot. You're talking about we use land swim. Yeah. I have yet to figure out how to actually search, do like a search the land swim, like you're all the house. I'm just curious, does it just not have it? I don't know. I don't know if land swim at all. I, I would lie to you if I said something about it. I, I, I just figured I'd ask it. Go ahead and get one of these techie guys out here. <coughs> well, we have blue beam and we have land swim. Yeah. Blue beam, we just use to mark stuff up. Yeah, Blue Beam is good, but I, I strongly recommend like On Center or something like that where you've got better capabilities. Yeah. So, okay. this Construct Connect that they have coming out now. I, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by that. Yeah. I am too, but I can only, I only want to use about 10% of it. Well, my deal is I have the computer programmer before, and anything that's new is, I usually wait for them to work out the button. Yeah, I never download off that. I had a question just about how you pick up equipment costs. So we buy a lot of equipment. Uh, we bought a lot of equipment, so we have like a skid letter in there, and it's got an associated rate that we figure out as a company based on all the stuff that goes into that. Yeah, depreciation, fuel, maintenance, all that stuff. Um, and then there's just the other side where you can rent it all. Um, and I'm just trying to figure out like, I, I, there's some variability in that. Like I, I feel like I bid a lot of jobs where I'm putting in all this equipment cost, and then we don't get the job. And so we don't pay for the equipment we're trying to pay for by me putting in that cost. And so I don't, and then I'm, I, so I'm just curious, like I don't, it seems like one of the only, like if, if your material's the same, and you're both union contractors, and the hours, you know, just, Maybe more or less. The other thing is the equipment. I don't know how you. Two schools in 
you're, you're a subcontractor? Yes, sir. Subcontractor. All right. There are guys that will not charge for their equipment, but they add money in their overhead to cover that, mm -hmm. which is cheap because you're not getting the full weight of that machine in there. Or if I pay the machine off, it's working for free, I'm not going to add money for it. Okay. If you run an estimate purely with rental equipment in there, you'll get your lunch handed. So there's 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 a uh, thing like this to play with. Yeah. If you don't have the machine, you have to rent it. No ifs, ands, or buts about it because you got to throw those costs in your estimate. But if your skid skid steer is paid for, I would not add it to my estimate. I'd add uh, a slight bit of depreciation mm -hmm. for it, and I would add my fuel, oil, and gas, and maybe some repair money. Don't take the full hit. Because so I can tell you, the guy sitting over here is not doing that. Yeah. The biggest dirt contractor in Chicago, Dale Berger with Berger Excavate, does not add equipment to his estimate. Because they're all, and he just wins enough for it. He's able to pay for it. He wins it and pays for it. Okay. And he kicked my ass for seven years. So you got to figure I out. I never beat him. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to figure out which school of thought you're pursuing and go full bore at that. Talk to your accountant, how you can set up your equipment, what's it's paid for, cover its maintenance, cover its uh, fuel and oil gas. We have all Don't the rates. cover the replacement. We'll have like skids for $50 an hour. And by the end of the job, it's like a lot of money. A lot of money. And so it just. Yep. Think about it. How often are you going to, are you going to have the skids on the job full time? Or are you going to have to do it for five weeks? Or you need a place to park it? Yeah. There's going to be a place to park it, they'll charge for it. Charge it when it's by, come up with an hourly rate for it and put it right into your crew. And if you're going to like with, That's what we've done. Yeah. When I, when I, it's when my utility work, yeah. work yeah. I come up with a crew, the backhoe, the rubber tire blower, the, the uh, bow bag compactor, five guys, the box, miscellaneous. I come up with a crew rate. And when that crew is running 100, pipe, 100 feet of pipe an hour, well, there at the end, that stuff comes off the job. But you need to have it when it's there. It, it's, you're walking a tightrope. You're walking the edge of a razor blade, and no matter how you fall off, you're going to be cut. How bad do you want to be cut? Something to think about. Um, one if I want the job from that, I don't think you could do it. Stay the hell with it. So, uh, one of the things that I uh, had started some time ago, is that uh, I have our cost of doing business, our basic overhead. Mm -hmm. and we know what that is year to year. And it changes because there's equipment comes and goes and people come and go, blah, blah, blah. You get the building paid for, it's in the building, whatever. And insurance, we have this fairly good size insurance burden. And so I take that number, and I let this job, and I look at, I look at our, our gross income over the last year, and I say, this much money has to, has to support this much money. So each job, each dollar that we, if the, what a, a long-winded, excuse me, but the job, I have an Excel spreadsheet, and at the end of the, at the job, You've got a number, yes. and that is ultimately a percentage of your annual sales. Yes. And that percentage of the annual sales populates the insurance, the job site insurance, all, all of your overhead gets populated into the job dependent upon the percentage of your gross annual business. That's an excellent way of doing it. You've got Total volume of 100 million. Mm -hmm. I have fixed cost to operate at 10 million. That's 10 million divided by the 100 million gives me a percentage of what I have to cover on each job. Every dollar that's every dollar has got to support this much overhead. The thing you have to watch with something like that is make sure you get enough volume in there so that when, on December 31st, all ledgers are reading zero. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't get enough work, guess what? I always, use, down. I always use 13 months and we got bonus money and party money. Yeah, there you go. 
There you go. All right. Anybody else? Thank you for your time. I hope I didn't bore you too much. And, uh, enjoy this, and I hope somebody ever got something out of it. Okay. Any questions? Your, uh, can we, uh, can we give you your email address? Oh, I've got a handful of cards. I'll just give them. Anybody wants one, I'll give you one.